introducing Max Almy and Terry Yarbrough. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. We're here to talk about VR for good, the transformative potential of immersive reality. Join us. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Okay. Uh, I'm Terry Yarbrough, and I am the president of Magica and Magical XR. And I'm a creative director and a digital media artist. I'm professor of VR and digital media, and I'm an AR VR evangelist. Okay, I'm Max Almy. I'm the dean of the School of Digital Media at SCAD, uh, Savannah College of Art and Design. Uh, I'm a creative director, a digital media artist. I've been in it for a long time in media, and uh, I'm also an AR VR evangelist. Um, to get um, started, I just want to say that um, we are, we're going to show you some cool stuff and some fun stuff and some impactful stuff and we hope to inspire. Uh, at the same time, we're gonna be tossing ideas back and forth, so this will be a little bit casual and fun. And it's a scatter shot, so we're gonna look at a lot of immersive uh, technology that's being used across a number of um, mediums. But immersive reality has been called an empathy machine, and studies have shown that it takes our brains 20 seconds to accept virtual reality. That's pretty extraordinary. So if our brains can't tell what, what is real and what is synthetic, that we've, we've really left the screen. We're entering an untethered reality, which is really has amazing implications for designers. Artists and designers are just beginning to explore the transformative power of immersive reality. There's a rising spirit among students, I can attest to that, and artists, designers, and technologists to harness this power and to enable social connections Collaboration, co-creation, more conscious living. They're women, they're diverse, they're inclusive, they're creating wild art and working in hospice. They're changing people's lives and seeking a better world. They believe in VR for good, VR for impact, and AR VR for peace. So I wanted to just start by talking about Chris Milk. How many people have ever seen Chris Milk or in a TED, TED talk talks. or something like that? Yeah. Okay. He, he's one of the people that's being called the godfather of VR. And he's probably the person that coined the term that VR or immersive reality is an empathy machine. Um, and I wanted to just mention one of his many projects. It's called Clouds Over Cedra. And it was done as an initiative for the United Nations. And it literally takes you into an immersive journey into a Syrian refugee camp in Jordan and you are walking around with a 12-year-old girl, Sidra, and she's just talking about what her day is like. And it, it's very impactful. And what's so astonishing about it is you are literally sharing the dirt with Sidra. And as a consequence, this was shown to a number of people at the UN who make decisions that can change people's lives. Okay. Uh, now we're talking about a project from Stanford that, that was called Becoming Homeless. And again, very much like Cedra, you are put into the actual lives. You put on a VR headset and you are in a 360 environment, which takes you through a story of losing your job, losing your apartment, having to sleep in your car, and then eventually sleeping on public transit or just being totally homeless. And I'll tell you, I've, I've done this project, and it's, it's a, a remarkable experience. You feel fear. You feel stress, because you go through all these stages, and you wonder, oh my god, this, this could be me. So, And there's a little bit of gamification to it. There's a ticking time going off. You have to make choices of what are you going to sell in your apartment to make your rent. And if you don't sell everything in, in a timely way, you're out of your apartment. So, But this is what we mean when we talk about VR with, for impact. I mean, it's such an amazing and visceral, vis, visceral experience. Another uh, project that, uh, that is amazing is called Carne y Arena. And I'm going to butcher um, this guy's last name. It's um, Alejandro Inaritu, and he's the Oscar winning director that did Birdman. And he created this amazing immersive art installation and a VR experience. Uh, and it's about um, being an immigrant, 
and you literally take off your shoes and you walk through the desert. The whole gallery is filled with sand. You put on um, a VR headset and you experience what somebody who's arriving at our border might be experiencing. And there's a terrifying scene where helicopters are coming down on you and you have people screaming at you and it's very impactful. And he won an Academy Award Special Achievement for Carne y Arena, Flesh and Sand. So those are, I think, excellent examples of, of VR, the impact that VR can have and AR projects also. But at the same time, artists are diving into brand new territory without borders, without definitions, and they're really trying new things. We're at the edge of new art forms, ones that merge the distance between the artist and the object. With all this new technology, we can take experiences out of the screen and into physical space. As artists, designers, creators, and educators, we have the unique opportunity to shape this new language and push the boundaries of what is possible. So this is a, um, a video, I don't think it needs much explanation, but this is um, some of the leading designers and artists in this space. You have to hit that, I think. In digital space, you can be anyone, you can be anywhere, you can be anything. Working in interactive media, there's no reason that the content has to be stuck on the cell phone. I think it can pop off into the real world too. To be able to paint and sculpt things in 3D space, I was like, this is something magical. This is gonna change the world. With augmented reality, it's great to be able to create a VR piece and import that and be able to show people in real life. They don't have to hop into a headset. My piece for the Festival of the Impossible is called Descent. You can bring things off the screen and into the real world, and you can really cause this sort of amazing effect in people where they don't realize how this is possible. It could be in a gallery or it could be on the street. So getting people experiencing something hands-on is important. My role as an artist is to try to put people away from their daily reality. Because these experiences are spatial and they're interactive, it totally changes the grammar of the previous art forms. So we need to discover a new grammar. I think what this will do is allow more creators to jump in to help define what this creative space might be. As a woman, as a person of color, like there's certain opportunities that I'm allowed in a new space that I might not be allowed in a different space. Everyone will be experimenting and trying different things. I think that's the exciting part. Now we have all these new technologies to get out of the screen and bring those experiences into physical spaces as well. When I first did that, it was like a epiphany. It just became a lot of fun to push the boundaries of what is possible. Then we're going to look at some individual artists. Additionally, um, this is Stuart Campbell. He goes as Sutu Eats Flies. That's his handle. And he has created some amazing uh, software that's really artist friendly. That's something that's going on right now. Yes, we, we do amazing games at SCAD, and, and the industry is full of really high tech. Uh, programming and, and uh, software, but he has created stuff that's very friendly for artists to just jump into, artists and designers. One thing that um, Stuart Campbell has created is called iJack, and it's an AR uh, program that you can download. It's free. Right now it only exists on the Mac, but you don't need to be a programmer or a coder to be able to dive into immersive mm -hmm. AR creation, so that's pretty exciting. Um, this is another person that we wanted to talk about. I don't know if you're familiar with Android Jones. He's kind of beyond modernism. In fact, he's kind of leading the charge of this kind of underground technodelic kind of work, if you will. And it's, it comes from maybe Burning Man and a lot of experience with a lot of different mediums all converging. Android Jones's company is called Microdose VR. It's kind of an interesting idea. <laughs> uh, some scientists say that your brain in immersive reality releases a chemical that's very um, similar to some of the altered states that people explore when they're on synthetic. Um, well, uh, I will, I, you fill in the dots there. Chemicals, uh, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, okay. but that would be <laughs> microdose VR. <laughs> Um, well, the other things that we're going to talk, show you is a show that's um, the featured exhibit for Ars Electronica this year. Or one of the featured, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's called um, Mirages and Miracles, and it's all augmented reality art. So it's traditional art, and then it's all viewed through your 
tablet or your phone. So it invites a lot of uh, user participation. Recently, I was contacted by the this is Smithsonian Jones. Museum to be part of a show called No Spectators. And they kind of gave me a lot of free reign on what kind of experience I wanted to create. We created these dodecahedron pods on both sides of the room. The non-spectator goes into the pod and puts on the VR headset. And immediately, they're actually transported into a digital version of the world that they were just in. And as they wander outside of the room, the environment they're in that was the Renwick Museum turns into this very imaginative fantasy desert landscape. Okay, this is the show by um, <clears throat> Andrian M. and Claire B., a Mirages and Miracles, and let's hit it. thing to keep in mind is they're looking, you are seeing this through somebody's iPad or somebody's mobile phone. And you'll notice people, uh, guests at this exhibit are looking at it through an iPad or a phone. Okay, then let's turn to fashion for a second. Uh, this is a really wild artist. Her name is Nixie Killick. And she does, her, her, her work in general is really amazing, but she's added AR technology to it to enhance her work. So this is a collaboration this with Stuart Campbell of IJEC. Exercise in really facilitating an intimacy with technology and things that we interact with every day. Garments to me are wearable tools. They carry our character. They allow us to project our personality. The idea of integrating something that can open up another dimension, that's where technology for me is such an exciting field. And the idea of merging those two together, augmented reality really presents that ability to build a new future, really decipher the color code and bring the reality to life on multiple levels. Uh, traditional fashion design uh, is also being influenced by these new technologies. Um, you can see here that uh, the artist, the designer, can use something like tilt brush, uh, which you saw the artist uh, designing in, in 360 space, or gravity sketch, which we'll talk about in a second. But you can, they can create gowns in 3D space. They can walk around the gown. They can size it up. They can size it down. And they can you know, exist with the piece before they create it because there's dress forms inside these programs. And so you can design in one-to-one -one space, which is really pretty amazing. This is a gentleman from uh, Nick Baker, who is a grad, uh, graduate from SCAD. And he ha he's living in New York now. He's using Gravity Sketch, one of these programs that we've been talking about, to uh, create uh, chairs, uh, furniture, um, product design. And he's just an example of one of these young artists who are diving into this technology to use it to create things in 3D space as prototypes, and then they can be transformed into actual products. I think he's here. Nick, are you here? <laughs> Yay. <laughs> OK. Hi, Nick. <laughs> OK, let's I'm play it. Baker. I'm an industrial designer in New York City. I've been experimenting with sketching and virtual reality. It's a great way to really quickly build out the form and understand it, which was a lot of fun. I'm inspired by all the mechanisms and functions of ideas that I've seen throughout my life. I was always trying to add value to the products, and that's what I try to do with all my designs, is to increase the functionality of these products and the give back to the customer. Okay, I just want to say that all these artists and designers are using these tools to create very free form and flowing new ideas. I, I think it's, the technology is really starting to influence design, which is amazing. So another area that's really being impacted by immersive reality is um, performance, and also uh, theater and music and esports. 
Absolutely yeah. everything. Yeah. Boards, yeah. So this is a look just at the way at Wave. It's a, a platform in which an artist can do a worldwide rave, and people put on a headset and enter, and they are uh, given a, an avatar. Um, this is another example. Ch Childish Gambino, a great artist, uh, in his own right, has uh, he, he as you know he creates amazing looking performance pieces for his concerts, but he's jumped into uh, VR and AR to augment those experiences and invite the, the guests in, the viewers in, in a new way. Um, the next slide I'm going to show you is a, actually it's a video, it's a really quick look at Imogen Heap, who's a well-known um, Grammy-winning musician, and she's also uh, invented instruments. And what's really amazing about her performance in WAVE is that her body has been digitized so that it can be exploded out as particles. I think they use photogrammetry to achieve it. And, and people are invited into her concert space in VR. So she's doing a live performance and they're in the space. We're going to squi sh switch gears here for a second and talk about VR for impact. A lot of the leading corporations involved in VR and AR, like uh, HTC Vive, uh, have created projects where artists and producers can come to them with ideas. And uh, HTC is actually really, they have VR for impact as one of their initiatives. So that's an amazing kind of uh, movement in this technology. Um, they are definitely supporting the sustainable development goals that they were defined in the UN. And uh, the slug line I love is there can be no plan B because there's no planet B. So the HTC projects are, are heading toward those goals. Oculus for Good, or VR for Good by Oculus. Oculus is uh, another uh, headset designer, very amazing products, um, they have in, their initiative is VR for good. And again, they're supporting projects uh, coming from all different directions that are all along the lines of projects for good. So why am I an AR VR evangelist? Because I've seen amazing things. And experience matters. And science tells us that we retain things if we experience them long after we just read something. So I want to show you something. Um, immersive reality is leading the way in medical breakthroughs. I want to show you just this clip from the Olympics. You might remember this. This is an amputee, and she's having a lot of trouble walking until she puts on some VR headset, and she sees her feet, and she sees her feet walking, and her brain gets that message, and she's able to use, um, she's able to use her... Start taking some steps. Yeah. That always makes me cry, I swear. Um, another amazing project is the Walk Again project in which paraplegics were given Oculus therapy twice a week. They're put in headsets and also exoskeletons. So um, they were able to move their legs with um, robotic help. But what they saw in their Oculus headsets is they saw their feet moving. And the brain started to get that signal that they could walk. And consequently, patients started to uh, regain certain muscles in parts of their legs. I'm sorry, it just it okay. chokes me up talking about it. Anyway, some of them regained bladder and bowel control, so it's, it's, it's pretty profound. It's really the tip of the iceberg with the medical field because they've, done, they've been working on this for years and they're doing such profound work with AR and VR. This is um, the poster child for, I'm not going to show you this video, but this is the poster child for the Lucille Packard Hospital at Stanford. 
Every kid that's admitted there is given a VR headset, and they are pioneering distraction therapy. Um, this child had, Miles had his foot run over by a truck, and he's had 10 corrective surgeries, and every time they go to change his sutures and his bandages, they had to uh, anesthetize him and give him opiates. And they started using VR, and he doesn't take any medication to have his bandages changed. And he's playing a game called Cheeseburgers in Space or something. It's better than opioids. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, Terry and I are artists, and uh, we've done work uh, in technology for many years. And um, the most recent project that we did, of course, we're working on a new project right now, but the last one was featured at the Telfair Museum in Savannah. And it, start, it was a retrospective of some of our installations that involved media and, and um, other things. But, but we decided to create a VR piece to go along with it, and we created a, basically a light sculpture. So as a result, we found that this project was super popular. The uh, museum kept it up for eight months, and it was popular with kids. S busloads of kids would show up to see it. The, the museum went through eight oculuses. Also <laughs> big kids, older people saw this. Mm. Um, and um, one older person who had an aversion to technology was so excited about virtual reality, she said to me, you know, I'm not afraid to die. I was like, whoa. So as a result of it, we started getting an idea, wouldn't it be great to make immersive experiences and take it to the terminally ill and take it to hospice. So this is a, um, a video of a woman that has stage four pancreatic cancer. Her name is Loretta. She wanted to skydive. We curated some experiences that wouldn't give her a heart attack so she could skydive. And it, it was hard to find ones that weren't like for teenagers, but we found, found some beautiful ones that she could experience. And then we showed her radiance. So Loretta, can you lean back in your chair? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the more you like flat, well, the more you lean back, the more you're going to be showered with light. Oh, okay. This is called. I can recline it. Okay. All the way back. Well, maybe three quarters of the way. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So now, here's what's going to happen. You're just going to see all this light falling on you, uh -huh. and you just lean back. It's like you're floating in space. Yeah. And enjoy okay. it. And then when you land, it's called radiance. All right. So to get it started. Okay, now look up. Look straight up. So I just wanted to mention um, one. Two SCAD alums were so excited about the work and the potential of the power of uh, VR in uh, the medical space that they formed a company called Seventh Heaven VR. Actually, one of them is here. Raise your Monica hand. Clark. Monica Clark is with us today. Anyways, um, so this work is, I think, is really powerful. They're creating uh, bucket list experiences for people in hospice and palliative care. Mm -hmm. Okay, well. I think you've seen a variety of new work being done. SCAD is at the forefront of working in this. We've been working with it for years, but last year we instituted a, the first BFA program, really rigorous, comprehensive one in a creative university, and we're very proud of it. Terry is turning on students to all of these kinds of ideas, and amazingly, what I'm finding is there is a rising population of young people who are so concerned with so many good topics like sustainability, um, medical uh, topics. I mean, the gamut. And I, I think that it's just bodes very well for the future. Um, we, we do, we've done projects in AR, we've done projects as you know, award-winning VR games. Uh, many of our programs in the uh, university are now coming to us to work with us, like fashion, architecture, UX design, UI design, just a, a full gamut. And actually, um, we're just, the final slides here are of a project that we did, Destination Imagination, which was a full-on theme park experience, location-based entertainment experience in VR, but it was tricked out just like Disneyland or Universal. And um, you uh, were taken through the experience, there were actors involved, there were set, sound design, lighting, uh, a whole experience with a pre-show and an after-show, 
and quite successful. But it was a, it's, a, it's an example of how we've been able to pull a lot of programs together and do these amaz amazing projects. And, the, and this is one image shot through the Oculus uh, glasses. That, so four, four kids were suited up like SCAD astronauts, and they went into space um, to, to get the message that they could come back and bring their creativity and, and, and do something with yeah, it. Yeah, even this project and the one that came after that this year uh, all had really good-hearted messages. So I'm so proud of our SCAD But this students. Is, this, this uh, slide is based on Google Maps, and it's this uh, Savannah. It's a look at Savannah from the air. <laughs> They're just about ready to take off into space. Yeah. yeah. OK. So I hope you agree that virtual reality, immersive reality, can stir visceral emotions. It can change our brain waves. It can help paraplegics walk. We really believe in the power of it as a transformative medium, that it can be a force for good in people's lives. As creators, designers, and educators, we are preparing for a screenless future. The separation between subject and object is disappearing. This is a future of spatial computing, and the world becomes our interface. We are on the edge of a major paradigm shift, a new way of seeing, a new language of communication, and new art forms. What an amazing time to be working, designing, and creative. And, and VR for good, join us. <laughs>